Laura, thank you so much for doing this interview with me. It's so nice to meet you. You too. You too. Thank you. So it's my understanding you are both an infusion nurse who treats many patients who require immunoglobulins as well as a PID patient yourself. Tell me a little bit about your journey. Yes, yes. So yes, I, I am a nurse. Um, I've been with allergy, asthma, and immunology for almost 28 years in, in October. So, um, but yes, I'm also a patient as well. So I was diagnosed, I was one of the lucky patients to be able to be diagnosed at a young age. I was 14. So way back in, in 1989, um, I was the, the sick child. Um, I have a, an, an older sister and a younger brother. So just sick all the time, just infections, infection, sinus infection infections, pneumonia. So um, I was uh, worked up by my family doctor who consulted okay. with an infectious disease. So I was pretty lucky that they they checked my Ig levels right away and was diagnosed right away. Started IVIG. I think it was in like two days because back then they didn't need any authorizations. So. So yes, yeah, started on IVIG, diagnosed with CVID, um, and started on IVIG. I did that for um, about 22 years and then switched wow. over to sub-Q. Yeah, so I've been on IG for about 35 years. And, um, you know, obviously, you know, high school age, college age, I really, you know, got to know my nurse because it was in IVIG infusions every month. So that you know, definitely uh, made me want to become a nurse. So I went to nursing school and then just started working at my immunology office, you know, right, right when I graduated. So I've just been there ever since. So, and I'm the IG coordinator now for, we have around 245 patients on immune globulin replacement. Wow. You know, I think that really speaks to how many people do rely on these. We think of these as rare diseases, but when you look across the spectrum of primary immune deficiencies, as well as the other conditions treated by plasma drive therapies, th this, this impacts a significant amount of people. It does. It does. It, it really wow. does. Yeah. yeah. So you mentioned you didn't need authorizations back then. I, this is a big <laughs> issue, I know, with yeah. sometimes with insurance companies. Have you ever personally experienced trouble getting your insurance company to pay for a specific IG formulation best for you? Or what have you experienced for, with your patients? Yeah, you know, I haven't personally, um, which is which is great. I have not had to have to struggle with that, you know, knock on wood, thank goodness. But, um, but yes, it, it's, it's an ongoing battle with insurance companies and, you know, switching products, different formularies. I just had one the other day, you know, we're on, you know, the doctor wants this. Nope, that's not on the formulary. That's, you know, that's under the medical benefit, not the pharmacy benefit. So, you know, we had to go with our third choice. So, mm -hmm. so yes, it's, it's, it's a big issue. And, and, you know, there's certain payers that are, you know, um, kind of worse than others, but, but it's definitely a struggle. You can't just, you know, the doctor can try to write for a certain brand, but you know, it, there's a real good chance, you know, we kind of have to follow the formulary steps, you know, and, and kind of fight that battle with payers. Wow. And can this have an impact on the patient in, in your view? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, maybe not necessarily someone naive to therapy and starting out, but if, yeah, if they've been tolerating well, we don't change it. You know, mm -hmm. if, if they're doing well, you know, it's helping with their infections. They're not having any side effects. We don't ever, ever change that, you know, so it's, it's really scary. And we do have a lot of patients. Every patient is unique. So is their treatment. So some of them react to certain things. A lot of them get some of these side effects. You know, some don't have any side effects, but you know, it's, it's a, it's a huge challenge if we do have to switch a product on a patient. I mean, this is a blood therapy, you know, it's plasma derived. So, I mean, it, it's, it's a big deal. It really is. And it impacts, you know, negatively to our patients. And have, have some of them experienced delays in, in, in getting a, the formulary appeals decision through or approved? Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Definitely. Definitely. A lot of the times, you know, if there's pushback, um, you know, I just had one recently 
only allowing 10% sub-Q products. And hey, they work. They all work well. They, you know, there's not a, a whole lot of difference in that IgG antibody, but you're talking volume. When you're talking a 10% versus a 20% sub-Q product, that's twice the amount of volume. So I can, you know, I, I, I get on the phone and, and try to fight with them on, you know, the why we need a 20% product. So sometimes we have to play their game and we have to put them on it. And then they fail the 10% product to, to, you know, finally approve that 20% product. But a fail first concept. Yes, yes. And why is volume such a big deal? You know, it's you're infusing under the skin, you know, especially for sub Q. So it's twice that amount of volume. You know, I have a high percentage of older population, Medicare age. They have other comorbidities as well. You know, just being able to infuse less volume, you know, is 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 definitely better for my patients, you know, Um and then with, you know, with IVIG, you know, there's, you know, 5% and 10% products. So I haven't seen a whole lot of formularies with the 5%, you know, um, products, but, but it's, it's definitely when you're infusing subcutaneously under the skin and you've been doing this for a long time, there is a big difference between a 10% and a 20%. You mentioned the sub Q, what percentage of your patients now get the sub Q versus the IV form because that's been a, a newer entrant. I mean, it's been around for some time, but you mentioned being able to switch yourself. How how much is it is sub Q used, and what is what is the benefit to the patient, or how do you decide um, sure. how they want to do this? Yeah. You know, you know, back then, you know, in, in the, you know, 80s, we only had one option, you know, IVIG, you know, and then the sub-Q products came out 2008, you know, 2010. So it's definitely kind of switched to, you know, sub-Q. Patients really like that freedom, flexibility to be able to infuse on their own time whenever they want to at home. So they um, do it themselves at home. Yes. Yep. Self-administered home or they have a caregiver. Like I said, I have a lot of older patients, so they usually have a spouse or an adult child that might live close by that can help administer that. Sometimes I do have a nurse come out, you know, if they need extra help to administer that. But um, but it's definitely a lot more. I want to say I would if I had to guess, I would say IVIG 20, 30 percent you know, and then sub Q is, you know, 70%. So it's, you know, it's definitely kind of switched to sub Q. We've got the, you know, weekly conventional sub Q and then the facilitated sub Q that really appeals to patients. Um, there's less systemic side effects with the sub Q infusion than with IVIG. Um, but I do have a lot of patients that are still on IVIG and they love it. They like going and getting their infusion once a month. Some of them, don't want to bring it home and have to think about their disease and infuse on a weekly basis. They just, you know, want to go to the office or go to the outpatient hospital and get their IVIG. So, you know, working in this industry for so long, it's so nice to actually have so many choices now. Patients never used to have choices, you know, it was just IVIG. So I like the fact that it's kind of a shared decision making now. It's the provider, you know, and the patient, you know, and then the nurse too. the whole, you know, ecosystem to kind of help figure out which therapy is best for patients. Is this one of the reasons you are so active with with the Immune Deficiency Foundation, this education piece, the empowerment, making sure patients really understand their choices and that the organization is there to help be an advocate. Yeah, what motivates you to be such a strong advocate yourself? Yeah, you know, and it, it's a rare disease, you know, primary immune deficiency as well as HAE as well. So, you know, they don't, you know, most of my patients when they're diagnosed, they don't know anybody that has this disease and I am their only person, you know, that can talk about it. So absolutely, you know, the Immune Deficiency Foundation, you know, we have been active in that, you know, since it, since it started, you know, since I became a nurse in, you know, 1996 and, you know, just having that resource for patients, you know, as well as other nurses too, and education on that. And, and I feel like, you know, our practice, I mean, I'm so grateful for my job to be able to be that immune globulin nurse to, 
be there for patients, you know, if they have questions and, you know, explain the different options that they have. Unfortunately, some patients, you know, if they live maybe in a small town and, you know, the physician may not have a whole lot of experience with it, they they don't know, you know, so it's it's definitely really important, I think, to have these organizations and give that information to my patients, like you said, empower them, you know, give them the Immune Deficiency Foundation or the Hereditary Angioedema Association information so that they can, you know, connect with them. You mentioned some of the side effects. I, I personally would like to hear more. What are some of the side effects that can arise? And is it necessary sometimes through a patient's lifetime to switch their particular medicine or brand, et cetera, because of that? Yeah, well, you know, for IVIG, because it's going, you know, you know, right into the bloodstream, there is the potential for more, you know, systemic adverse reactions, such as maybe some flu-like symptoms, you know, headache, uh, maybe some nausea, fever, things like that, some body aches and chills. So um, that that can occur, you know, during the infusion or even shortly after. So most of the time, though, you know, it is rate related. So we can usually alleviate a lot of those side effects by slowing the IV rate down, making sure patients are very hydrated, you know, especially for the first couple of infusions, you know, they may potentially have a few more side effects. So we definitely want to run that really, really slow. Um, and then, or if, you know, we are switching products. If it's a brand new drug, which is why we don't really like to switch if we don't have to, they could potentially have some of these side effects. So some patients may have have to pre-medicate, you know, Tylenol, Benadryl, every once in a while, maybe steroids, but most of the time it's it's tolerated pretty well. And, you know, the sub-Q route, less systemic adverse reactions because it's slowly absorbed into the sub-Q tissue. It really doesn't even reach the bloodstream for, you know, a couple of days. So, you know, just the local redness and swelling um, can happen with, with a sub-Q infusion. Thank you. That really is so educational for me. Mm -hmm. um, now, I know the American Academy of Allergy and Immunology states IVIG not interchangeable. Do you agree with that? Yes. Yes. There's no generics, you know, um, at all. Then, you know, trying to get you know, always pushing back with the insurance companies. So they're not interchangeable. You know, there's different formulations, indications, you know, pH, different stabilizers, you know, and, you know, most patients do tolerate it pretty well, but we do have some patients that have had reactions to certain, you know, brands or, you know, different stabilizers and things like that in there. So absolutely that, you know, it's, it's, it's funny um, when you hear that, oh, you know, is generic. Okay. Well, no, it's not. Okay. There's no generic anyway <laughs> with, yeah. with IG products, but but absolutely, I'm you know I'm hearing from some specialty pharmacies too. They're they're eliminating um, the brands on their forms. They just want you to send that in non-branded, and and they'll figure out the best product. And I'm like, no, <laughs> no, we're not going to have you find the best product. You know, our physicians are going to choose the the right product for the patient. So, so yeah, I I don't like hearing that. There's there's no generics and, you know, the patient needs needs a particular product based on their own individual characteristics, needs, if they have any other comorbidities, you know, what their health is like. Unfortunately, these patients not only have a primary immune deficiency, a lot of the times they have other, you know, maybe some heart disease, kidney disease, especially older patients and then other autoimmune diseases that we see in the PI population. So we really have to. Um, you know, take that into account when we're when we're choosing an IG product. Do you have any personal recollections of when a new patient comes in and starts to get those infusions? Um, do they feel markedly better? Or what have you heard from people as far as, like you said, you were lucky that it was relatively early in your life. There is the pattern of the sick child, you know, and then starting to look for that. But how much of a difference can these therapies make? 
I mean, it's literally life-saving for patients. I mean, you know, you've got patients like my, you know, when I was first diagnosed, my IgG level was, was 80, you know, dangerously low. And I mean, once I got started, I never got pneumonia again. You know, you still can get some infections, you know, especially maybe some sinus infections, but it's, it is life-saving for patients. You know, it's getting the IgG antibody, you know, replacement that the patient needs. And some patients, you know, may feel better even after that first infusion. I usually tell them, you know, it might take a little bit of time. You know, you're, we got to get that IgG level up, you know, and get that to a steady state level. But, but um, it is, it's, it's, it, they're just, their, their quality of life is so much better once they're on these infusions. So yes, it's, it's amazing to, to see that. <laughs> we always talk about this being such a unique biologic that comes from human plasma. Literally a plasma donor's antibodies are helping another person live their best life. Mm-hmm. What are your thoughts on the need for plasma donation and how, how we need to raise awareness about this? How can we celebrate plasma donors? What are your thoughts on that? I know. And, you know, I have to admit, sometimes we do, we don't, you know, we almost take it for granted, you know, and I hate saying that, but it's true, you know, but you just think, oh, I have my infusion. I get it delivered to my house, you know, once a month, you don't really think about it, but you're, but, you know, I I do remember a lot because I'm teaching my patients on the phone with them, you know, you're getting this product that is plasma and it's from thousands and thousands of different donors. And we need that to keep patients healthy. You know, you need all those different antibodies, you know, circulating all the time to, you know, protect them from bacteria and viruses. So it's, it's amazing. It really is. It's um, you can't, you can't make this in a lab, you know, it's, we rely on these, on these donors. So, I mean, I'm just so grateful that there is actually a treatment and, um, and patients can get it, you know, there's, I remember, you know, in, in the nineties, there were some shortages and, you know, some scares as well. You know, um, I think it's comforting when I talk to my patients about that, you know, I don't really get any, um, anyone really concerned that it's plasma, which is, which is great. You know, I think, um, you know, it, it's so safe. They're all FDA regulated, but I never, ever really get any questions like, I don't know if I want to take this, Laura, but I always tell them, hey, I've been on it. I've been on IG for 35 years <laughs> and, and I'm doing great. So, but no, I mean, it's, I'm, I'm just so thankful for, for the plasma donors. I mean, it's, it's just life-saving for patients. 